Welcome everyone to Everyone's Welcome, a fresh conversation about disability. We've got a great conversation today with Cantor Tamar Havilio about spirituality, inclusion, and belonging in preparation for the high holidays. Just a few quick notes as we begin. In the midst of the pandemic, Shelley and I created Everyone's Welcome to bring people together for conversations about disability, mental health, diversity, and inclusion. Our guests stop by to share their experiences and their stories, providing food for thought as we pursue diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in our faith communities and in society. Everyone's Welcome is a collaboration between Whole Community Inclusion at Jewish Learning Venture and Inclusion Innovations. We are captioned. All you have to do is click the CC icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and that will start the captions for you. We're also streaming today on Facebook Live and we are just so grateful that you're all here. We, we do record each episode in case uh, folks want to watch it at a later time. You'll receive the link in the email when you registered and we invite you to share this episode and every episode with people in your life who care about these important issues. We invite your questions and comments. Feel free to use the chat function and we will get to your questions and comments at the end of our conversation. Great, thanks Gabby. Wow, we've been doing this since a year ago in May, which is very exciting. And today we are beyond thrilled to welcome Cantor Tamar Havilio. Originally from Milwaukee, Cantor Havilio completed an undergraduate degree in theater at the University of Iowa. And after, um, after that, she began cantorial studies at Hebrew Union College in Jerusalem. After completing the cantorial program, Cantor Havilio served congregations in New York, New Jersey, and Milwaukee before she headed back to school to pursue a master's program at NYU's Tisch School of the Arts in the Performance Studies Division. In 2002, Cantor Havilio returned to Hebrew Union College in Jerusalem as a member of the faculty, where she taught the reform movement's future Jewish leaders. In 2008, she became head of the cantorial studies on the Jerusalem campus. She's also been active with the Women of the Wall movement, where she's known as Cantor of the Kotel. In 2020, in the midst of the pandemic, Cantor Havilio joined Bet Shalom Congregation, and she is the Cantor at my home congregation, which I'm so excited about. We're just so excited for Cantor Havilio to talk with us about spirituality, diversity, music, and inclusion as the Jewish holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur approach. And we're also so happy that you're all with us today. So I'm going to turn this over to Gabby. All right. Thank you, Shelley. So we are talking about spirituality, diversity, music, and inclusion as we open this new chapter, a whole new year, which will be here before we know it. Um, we're wondering, besides your own cantorial career, you've taught so many students in those years you were at HUC in Jerusalem. How did you know or feel that becoming a cantor was what you were meant to do in life? And, and how did your own life experiences contribute to your approach in, in teaching? Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm so thrilled to be here. And uh, Shelly is my, just my Torah cohort, I should say, my Torah buddy. What do we call ourselves? The Yad Squad at Beit Shalom? We're the Yad Squad. Yad Squad. <laughs> and um, so I, I guess I want to start with, um, I became really an actress when I was a young kid. I was in theater for a very long time. And um, when I was kind of working as an actress and a waitress in Chicago in the 19, late 1990s, um, I kind of went to synagogue and saw for the first time a woman canter. 
And her name was Cantor Aviva Katzman, still around. She's not a Temple Sholem anymore, but she's since retired. And she was, you know, a woman Cantor, pregnant. And she literally said to me, I walked into her office to know about what this Cantor world was like, because I was fascinated and enthralled with her beautiful prayer and and not just her voice, but her how she led services, et cetera. And she said, you know, I'll help you. And in the meantime, you can help me because I'm giving birth in a few months and you can help me lead services. So the first time I led services, I was literally with my cantor, Aviva Katzman, when she went into labor. And she said, okay, you're leading services Friday night. I didn't know Hebrew at the time. I knew very little. I knew the letters. I knew a little bit about decoding, but not so much. And um, she just gave me all the music. So, and I listened to her and I was going to services every week. I was, became just, you know, one of those groupies, one of those temple groupies. And it really was kind of like a coming home. And then she led me to Hebrew in college and I was accepted in, um, 1992 and I was off to Jerusalem so kind of backtracking in my own life I um as a musician always struggled with music reading and I wondered why that I had this struggle with music reading and in hindsight if I would have been born a little later kind of in a different time when, when people were looking at learning disabilities, I would have understand that I have um, uh, dyslexia. That's really math. It's disc, you, you guys probably know it. Discographia, I think. Discographia. Dyscalculia. There you go. There I you think go. It's dyscalculia. Dysgraphia is the writing. Right. Which affects, doesn't affect language in the, in the, in letters. Actually, I was always good with languages. It affects the language of numbers. So counting, I could read music, but counting was really off for me. And I never understood that, of course, until I went down a road of having kids that were dyslexic and having a person who was actually um, have, doing a, a check with my son. And he actually, she actually looked at me and said, I wonder where this is coming from. And we had the conversation and she opened me up to learning about my own um, learning disability, which I had. And then I was like, oh, a light bulb went off. So I understood things that I never thought I would. And I also understood then how I learned because I taught myself how to read music very fast in cantorial school. And I never understood why, how I could. And it was mostly oral. So anyway, so that's just a little background about my own learning how I learn. And that kind of, I think, made me a better teacher in the sense of how I listen to my students. One of my students is here, Emily Dana. And I, I just really kind of looked at it as not only a sympathetic feeling of teaching um, people of all abilities and learning styles, but also people with, um, I, I was empathetic. I actually felt their frustration or their struggle in a very real way. And it wasn't until I had a student, Rabbi Bill Tepper, who um, came to me and he said, Cantor, I'm 90 some percent deaf, but I was never deaf as a child. It actually, he had a disease that made him gradually deaf. And he said, but I'm desperately want to learn how to chant from the Torah. And I was like, okay, Bill, we are going to learn how to chant from the Torah. And why did this shape me? Because my mind went and I have a very, um, you know, cre creative mind. And I was like, well, cantillation was never written down. It was always through the body. So I started doing the hand movements of Hieronymy, which is the original type of how people learn how to chant trope. And through my hand motions and my mouth, Bill Tepper, to this day, he always says, I am the one who tan chant taught him how to teach, how to learn trope and then teach trope. 
So by empowering him, I used to have two sections by the way of cantillation. I still did for a very long time. I had music readers and non-music readers. The non-music readers were a lot of rabbinic students. Of course, the music readers, a lot of them in the cantillation in the cantorial, but I realized that actually the system through the body helped all the learners. Now, some, some learners, by the way, I did come across where they would say to me, you know, it's not doing it for me. I can't look at the music and do the hand motions. And I would sit with them and say, okay, then take away the hand motions and just look at the notes. If that's going to do it for you, whatever makes, you know, whatever makes it that you can learn it. I really believed in it. It also came from, by the way, all these kinds of looking at how each student learns and how each student is emotionally connected, by the way, to the learning, is that I often found that students would get so frustrated with something that when I took them aside and said, okay, let's look at it this way, or look at it this way, or look at it this way, or try to think of it in, in, in a repetitive version of what's on the page, don't even look on the page. And I won't go into so many details, but I sat with students and I found that they would learn and, and I would empower and I would be empowered so much from them in feeling out this both emotionally connection to text, which was I was very interested in, physical emotion, physical emotional connection, but also like this body memory. So um, all those connected, I felt really led me and my canter it, but led me to believe that each person I came to, to teach text, how it was going to come to life was that they had to internalize it. They had to eat it just like ta'ame mikra, so the taste of Torah. They had to eat it and regurgitate it. And that, that, that was really a kind of, the process and the philosophy, maybe it's written down. I am not trained. I was just about, if I was not coming to Beit Shalom to be Shelly Christensen's cantor and work with her side by side, I was going to be trained. Dr. Andrew Weiss was going to put me forth to be the one trained on the Jerusalem campus to help all students with disabilities in their learning processes. So I'm passionate about it. And it's led my canter it in all ways, because it's not just about how I look at how I teach, it's how I pray and how I, I don't know, expand people's worlds so that they're not just thinking that the text is something far from them. Does that help? That's kind of a big kind of picture of where I'm coming from. Um, yeah. No, no. It's great because, I mean, even in as we get approach the high holidays, which is going to be our next area, um, Parshat Nitzavim, it is, it's not up in the skies, in the heavens so far. It's not in the seas. It's here. It's, it's it here. And that's, he, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> exactly. And so it, it's, it really is that I love the the taste eating that that view of acquiring knowledge and making it meaningful and that's that's kind of the point of all of this anyway just so great well and I think yeah. that um it's it's not it's not the norm by the way to think and to think of students or think of learners that are not getting something like a b c and d do you know what i mean like not getting it in the, in the i don't even want to say traditional way because i don't think there's any traditional way of learning i think that there was a set way of learning for people way back when and people that didn't fit in that fell down in the cracks and people that were in that were just soaring and the yep, rest yep. were falling by the side. So I never wanted students of Torah to fall by the side. And I think that that comes from, um, if you look at the text of Atem Nitzavim, Hayom, Kulchim, we all stand here. 
we all stand here, whatever our needs are, whatever our desires are. And right. we have to be open to the possibility of reaching out to others in different ways and not, not through the kind of standard way we think everything should be. I yeah. think that that's really the important thing. It's not so, it's not an, ever in a box. It's a wonderful adventure to, or to be on someone's journey, helping them to learn and, and supporting them and figuring it out. It's not always easy, but it's certainly, it's just, yeah, it's such a great, it's just a great thing to see somebody thrive. And you know what? I don't think it's, yeah, I totally agree with you. I don't think it's always easy, but it's the right thing. Absolutely. Well, let's go to the high holidays since we're, what, two weeks away, two and a half weeks away? Who's counting? But Tamar, how do you prepare for the high holidays, both professionally and personally? Um, first of all, the music's something that really affects me. And, uh, and the text, I have been working with the High Holiday Choir at Beit Shalom since June. And actually in June, you know, we were doing it without masks. Now we're with masks. So um, it's, you know, we're in a pandemic that never ends. And we are trying as clergy as we may to try and figure out everything to be the best that we can. And the other day we had a funeral actually in the synagogue. It was the first funeral I ever did in the synagogue. Every funeral I've done is on Zoom. And um, there were 250 people in the sanctuary or more and everybody was masked, but I was a little, all of a sudden I was like, wow. I, I used to be used to crowds of thousands, a thousand easily, but I couldn't believe, I was like so excited to see the people, but also so in this sense of, okay, where am I? Why, and why is this connecting to the high holy days? I really kept thinking of, um, don't hide your face from me, you know, from the Psalm 27, which we say every day during the month of Elul, don't hide your face from me. I'm at, you know, I'm asking for your help. Please, God, don't hide your face from me. And it really connected to two things. It connected to the mask, but it also connected to this face, this face of saying, please, God, be with us. Please, God, protect us and get us through this, this narrow passage, which I thought we were also through more. Um, and I think that more people in the high holy days, we'll see people coming in person at our synagogue, just because we we were dedicated to doing it in person, but instead of having 50% capacity, we'll probably have 20%. If I'm looking at our numbers that are signing up right now to be in person and so many people on live stream or, you know, on zoom. So I think that, I think that the world is bigger. It's not just the building. And at this high holy days, we have to reach and grab and kind of as a, as a canter, I have to continually think about not just the people that are sitting there and what's the pen, what the pandemics really taught me is the people all out there. People and the people that will only feel comfortable ever just doing live stream or Zoom. And that's a miracle. I think the fact that we have come into this age where we can have our congregations are not just our walls. It's a miraculous thing for many people who are scared to come to the synagogue because of illness, because of disability. And now they feel like they can be at home. Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. that's really an amazing thing. And it came to me more so than anything during this funeral. And I thought, wow, this is a lot of people, but I also thought, wow, people want to be together and people want to reach different places, but also the place that the people that were also on Zoom for the funeral, there was just as many, like a hundred Zoom boxes too. It's really oh. generating not just a sense of community, which we all crave, 
but it's really creating a sense of belonging, belonging to something. And it's, yeah, it's been a blessing in within the curse. <laughs> For sure. And I, I love that you brought out the way that this high holiday season is going to look and be different for where we are and how people return, whether there are opportunities in different communities for in-person engagement or being connected and that we've expanded this out, outlook of what, of what community is. Um, and my next question about the high holidays is really about the music since that's at your heart. What effect have you experienced that the music, as we return to the high holidays, that just hearing hearing that new sock, those melodies from the holidays, what effect does that have on people? I think it brings them back to memory. And music, music really is very nostalgic, right? So most people don't know what they don't know what that means it's an aramaic they read it in the english afterwards but for ashkenazic jews because it's not so sephardic um they hear that tune and they think well i'm here i'm here at yom kippur and even before that with the Avinu makenu, avinu makenu, avinu makenu, chonenu vahanenu, ki ein banu masim. So when they hear that, first of all, I think that I have to stand and open the ark. But even if you're sitting in your house, you hear that and you know that it's the high holy days. And while for me, what's been really empowering at this time musically is hearing the voices, right? So having my choir sing and finally sing together because it was very lonely to do those video recordings with the choir last year. And so coming back and hearing that kind of together music is also very powerful. Um, I think that if anything, my heart is kind of torn at this time because I'm thinking this wonderfulness of that we can be together, but also this kind of timidness about, you know, is it so safe to sing? Even if we're singing with masks, is it so safe? And I have these moments of... At, <laughs> I can't even explain them. On the other hand, um, the music of the High Holy Days, I love the High Holy Days. No matter what, where I've led High Holy Days, I, you know, some people dread them as clergy because it's stressful and it's, I just can't get enough of them. And from the moment I walk into the, that, that moment of Rosh Hashanah, Die, 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 you all know the tune. So we, continually think to yourself it's just this oh my gosh we've made it we've made it this year we've come a lot a long way we've also come a long way because we realized that we could can do it all so if we have to be like this in our little boxes at a certain time we can do it and we can handle it and if we can be in our congregations physically that's also awesome and for most people preferred. Ha -ha. But, I'll have a baby. <laughs> but I have to say that it's Puppy preferred. Suck. But they get turned into good dogs. My, <laughs> yeah. Do you want to mute that person, Shelly? <laughs> yeah. Here. There we go. I can't, I can't <laughs> do it, but you can, I think. I know and, it's so distracting, anyway, right? It's like, oh, I want to listen no, to what I they're just, saying. I just, think, I just yeah. think that um, I'm sure there are some of you on here that say to yourselves, it's just much easier for me to be on Zoom mm -hmm. or for me to be on live stream. Yeah, 
I, I was just uh, completing our registration today for at Betch Loan. We're all registering for what services, what time we're going, whether we're going to be live stream or Zoom. Mm -hmm. And we, we did a combination of things. But I have to say, it's more because we like to have dinner as a family before services. So now we don't have to drive anywhere <laughs> or rush through dinner. So another perk, another benefit. So as we were talking about, um, you know, that we are offering so many different ways to access being part of the community for, for the high holidays, what are some of the challenges that you think synagogues should consider to create that sense of belonging and community? And what would, what are some ways you'd advise them just to think about for the high holidays? Well, I think you need to think, I think most congregations actually, Shelley, in the, in a glorious fashion, have thought of the fact that we have to open our walls in the sense of we're going to be in person for people that feel comfortable to be in person. And we're going to also be live streaming here on Zoom. And I think it's really important to know that that is not something we would have thought of before the pandemic as much. So that is a given. The fact that Zoom has closed captioning, which is brilliant. The fact that, um, I mean, I am lucky enough to be in a synagogue that's very accessible for wheelchairs mm -hmm. and um, for even, you know, people that are hearing impaired. So I think we're, you know, we're even to have somebody that can help with that in the live services. So I think that having those outlets, um, but also even in the teaching, like offering, we're offering our teaching or our studies on Yom Kippur afternoon, we're offering them live and on Zoom. And I think that that's really important, not just during the pandemic. I think, I think those things are, are here to stay. And in fact, I find Certain, and Shelly, you can talk to this, but certain times when I teach B'nai Mitzvah, it's harder on Zoom and certain things are actually easier because I can put on my screen trope. I can put on my screen the Torah portion really big. I can show them various things on the screen that I could do in a session live, like in person, but it's even easier on my screen and their parents don't have to slap them. And the other thing is that on the other part of it is that the in-person stuff is really important for someone with a learning disability in the beginning to actually map out, set, do a map for them and, and yeah. to understand how they're learning. That's it. Exactly. Because sometimes you don't understand to, you don't quite see on zoom what the child needs. By the way, I'll tell it's, you a funny thing yeah. is that I did have a child who was struggling with the Haftra and they did the Torah portion, but um, he came in to do his three weeks before his bar mitzvah and he came in with his whole Haftra transliterated. <laughs> and I never knew like what he was using because it was on Zoom. I was like, wow. Like, how would I, <laughs> I know? know. Exactly. How would I know? So in person, you do find out these things. And of course, when you set them in front of a Torah scroll, you really find out. But even in that, I've learned so much over this year, kind of in hindsight of what I've learned with my Hebrew and college rabbinic cantorial and education students over the last 17 years. It's like a natural kind of gateway. Mm -hmm. And... Um, because believe it or not, a lot of grad students find about their learning disabilities and their learning challenges in grad school. Oh, yeah. Not, not surprising I, there. Not <laughs> For unusual. Sure. So um, I just wanted to remind everyone, I know Jody had a question which she got in the chat and Jody, we will answer that. Um, Shelly and I just each have a one more question and then we're gonna get to, to your question. So if anyone else has a question, please feel free to put it into the chat. Um, 
So I am wondering, your music that you just gave us was so beautiful. Is there a particular prayer that you found over the high holidays that's most meaningful for <laughs> you? And is there something that you noticed really engages your community? Um, I would say healing prayers. And there's a number of them, right? So of course we have Debbie Friedman, who's our own St. Polly girl here, who um, started out in, in St. Paul at Mount Zion. And so her, you know, just, just me, or that, that, not, that's not hers. Sorry. That's another one. Um, now I'm thinking of three Misha Barak's. Why am I forgetting Misha Barak? Misha Barak So the one that I've been doing with the choir is by, um, I have two. The Heal Us Now, which is very popular by Leon Cher. Um, heal us now, heal us now, and bless us as well. So this one, the Lisa Lipko Levine, which we do, we're doing with violin. Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov. May the one who blessed our mothers, may the one who blessed our fathers, hear our prayer, hear our prayer, hear our prayer, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer and bless us as well bless us with the power of your healing bless us with the power of your hope may our hearts be filled with understanding and strengthened by the power of your love me Avraham, Yitzchak, Ve'Yaakov, Mi Shabeirach, Imotenu, Sarah, Riv, Kalea, Virachel, May the one who blessed our mothers, May the one who blessed our fathers, Hear our prayer, hear our prayer, Hear our prayer, hear our prayer, and bless us as well. So that's one of the versions that I know that they love to sing. So all it's of beautiful. the healing prayers. Wow. So all of the healing prayers, I think, are really, really powerful. All year round, but this high holy days. I'm actually starting with um, a mashup. It's a Debbie Friedman mashup on Erev Rosh Hashanah. What does a mashup mean? So two of her tunes. She has a Shema Kolenu um, that's so beautiful. Um, and it starts with, um, I don't have my music in front of me. So I'm all of a sudden I'm a The time, no, the time is now is a different song of hers, but this Shema, Shema Kodeinu, Adonai Eloheinu, da, 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 da. And in the middle of it has, Lai, 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 and so I'm starting Emperor Shoshana with this. The time is now. Come gather round. It's a whole beautiful piece, but it's about bring your burdens, bring everything with you. And we will help each other get through this. That's basically the Rashi of it. 
And then it goes back to the lie, thy, 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 a uh, physical Knesset, Beit Knesset, a physical gathering, and also a virtual gathering. So that wherever you are, you feel that kind of embrace. It's beautiful. Uh, it really is. I think a lot of people, these people that I, I know Gabby and I have worked with and a lot of people who are are here with us today and who will be with us in the in the recording, Re recognize that so many people who have been out on the margins of community life, synagogue life, um, have have the the music memory so deeply ingrained, and it's just this connection to to Judaism, this connection to the holidays, or the you know, and this is true, I think, in any faith, where the the music, the prayers form that bond and that connection and the thing that separates people isn't isn't that spiritual that that community it's it's the institutions that put up the barriers and the walls and so much of that has changed now too as we as we continue forward well i want it tomorrow this has been just amazing we can go on and on and on come back anytime <laughs> love to have you back what um is there do you want to share with us a, just another prayer or blessing or or tune to get us really in the high holiday spirit or is, in the spirit of things we've already got the introduction to here of yeah, I was going to say, what you just shared was so beautiful, but if there's another one, feel free. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the <laughs> tune that you, you know, everybody kind of goes back and forth in their mind is what, you know, the traditional high holiday sound is. <clears throat> Chonenu vahenu, avinu makenu. Chonenu vahenu, ki ein ba'am asim, asim anu tzedak getting my mindset from the summer, <laughs> from this humid mid-August to, to imagining the high holidays. It's so beautiful and we've enjoyed this conversation. And we have an important question that Jody put in the chat to me, which is something I must tell you, I've been thinking about and hearing about a lot as we were, we, you shared so many ways that you think about inclusion and the students you work with, and we mentioned captioning with Zoom. Um, and so the, the question is the Hebrew. Do, you know, we know that this kind of captioning we have available today is great for English, but not so much for Hebrew. And um, Jody mentioned that her husband's congregation has not used captioning because of the Hebrew and not the English. Do you have any thoughts around that? Um, so closed captioning, you mean for the, for hearing? 
right? For, yeah, for the for the, having the captions available on Zoom. More so for the the prayers, right? Well, I think a lot of synagogues. I don't know if someone says they use a live captioning company. Um, a lot of synagogues also are putting prayers on the screen so that the live stream, I know we are, we're putting whole pages of it on the screen. That's probably not the same as captioning, um, but the closed captioning then for speaking like sermons or stuff like that would be kind of easy to have in, right in the closed captioning on right. the screen. That that's <laughs> what, yeah, that's what I'm hearing that most folks are doing as a compromise, and maybe that's helpful, Jody. That all the times where it's purely English, a sermon, a Devar Torah, a welcoming message, all those times the Zoom captioning, just like we have today, will work for the prayer itself for the recitation of Hebrew or the Torah, that would be a moment, as you said, Tamar, to have the screen share um, because the words that are being recited by the clergy or whoever's leading are those same words. So it's not like the caption would be um, picking up something different. So it, it's, it's, I think, probably the best approach we have um, unless you are able, as Rachel said, to get that live captioning service of someone who could transcribe the Hebrew. And Rachel, is that what's happening? Is that how you do it? Then you have a captioning service that does a transcription to English or how does that? Because, you know, we have people on the stream and the Zoom captioning is not gonna show up on the stream either. Plus, if you have people in the sanctuary, we're doing a hybrid also, where we're going to have people coming into the sanctuary. And we have an aging congregation with many people who are hearing impaired and rely on the, on the um, captioning. And so we have been using a live captioning company um, that will put it on our stream as well, um, as well as our sign language interpreter for those who are deaf. Yeah, great. It's costly though. It's very costly. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, you have to weigh out, you know, you have to balance it maybe next year when we're all going to be in person, then we can do it in a different manner. But right now, since we're using different modes, it's. And I know um, Emily, Emily mentioned that um, using alt text with pictures for people who have screen readers. So that's gonna be really important to do that. Thank you, Emily. And Stacy, um, you had used a service that I think if I remember correctly, did transcribe the Hebrew or transliterate Hebrew. I'm just, I'm not sure. Do you wanna, I don't know. If I can't remember the name of the mm. company. But it, all of I, this, we really just, again, appreciate at this unique moment, thinking about um, all these ways that we want to keep, you know, pushing forward with inclusion of both people in person and online. So yeah. thank you all. And thank you, especially to you, Cantor Tamar Havilio. It was absolutely <laughs> Beautiful. There were so many things in the conversation that resonated. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I think um, I'm so grateful that you shared about your own personal experience in learning and how, you know, the more we understand that our leaders are people like us who all learn differently and um, to bring that sensitivity and empathy to your students and your congregation is really huge. So thank you so much. Well, it really put, oh, I was going to say, it really puts this, a, a new meaning to together at Sinai, that we were all gathered at Sinai. It's, it's, we come as we are, we show up for who we are. It's so beautiful. And it's also really, um, I just want to say that, you know, my student 
at Hebrew New College, Emily Dana is here. And Emily taught me a lot. And um, she had a lot of frustrating moments in her first year in Israel. And I think what, like Emily, my students have taught me is the ability to always be that teacher that listens and doesn't always think immediately how I'm going to solve their problems. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm a mom. I want to, I want to make everything better for everyone. But it's more of the listening and, you know, the kind patience. And those students at Hebrew and College, like Emily, gave me the ability to do what I do with all students of Torah. So it's really a gift. It's really a gift. Ah, the gift that keeps on giving. Keeps on it's giving. true. It's and now true. I work with amazing Torah people. So it's, it's really a blessing. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Well, Samar, thank you again. I'm, um, you know, we're all used to doing a, a two, two webinars a month, but our next season of Everyone's Welcome is starting in October. Um, we're not really taking the month of September off, but we do like to take a break from producing our episodes of Everyone's Welcome to focus on what we want to accomplish in the next season, which was starting in October. I think it's season three, the way we're counting. Okay. We have some exciting ideas. We'll share them when we're ready. And in the meantime, we invite you to download past episodes that you may have missed or to even revisit some of your favorites. They are available at jkidaccess.org. I'll put that up on the screen in just a minute. And if you have suggestions or guest ideas for future episodes, please contact us. And we have a new email address. I'm just going to share my screen. And now you can see that people are um, emailing me. Got that part. Um, the new email address, everyone's welcome, info at gmail.com. So feel free to, to link to us there. We also have our information here. And Gabby? Yes, Shelly. So we like to share information about our books. Shelly and I are both authors, and you can find our books all the places that you buy books. There they are. And... Um, also wanted to let you know on the next slide that this year we uh, created through Jewish Learning Venture a new book for everyone involved in early childhood education as well as parents and grandparents before you head back to school. Equip your classrooms and your homes with this book about the Jewish values of inclusion and uh, that is the site where it's available. So on that note, we're going to stop sharing and we're going to say goodbye. But before we do, we want to acknowledge everyone who is celebrating Yamim Norim, the high holidays. We wish you a sweet new year. In Hebrew, Shana Tova Umetuka. And again, as always, stay safe and be well. And look for the recording of this of this episode and we'll be back in october thanks for being with us today everybody thank you